Great. Well, thank you. It's a great honor to be here uh, today virtually, and uh, um, it's, uh, I've really been uh, excited to share some of the new things we're, we're trying to do. Uh, I direct a group at MIT that works on technologies for imaging and controlling complex biological systems like the brain. And we try to think very uh, ground truth oriented. So we understand the building blocks of life, how they interact, the molecules throughout cells, the cells throughout organ systems like brain circuits. And so today I'll tell you a few short stories about how we've tried to build tools that enable very detailed mapping, imaging, and control of biological systems with a, a focus on the brain. Let me share my screen here. Okay, is that showing up? Oh, there's a Zoom window at the bottom. How can I make it not cover the talk? Okay, there. Uh, we see it well so far, Ed. Okay, great. So our group uh, uh, really thinks a lot about the spatial and temporal scales over which biological systems like the brain operate. Um, biomolecules, gene products, and so forth are after all nanoscale things but organ systems like the brain are enormous, right? How can you see nanoscale things across large 3D expanses? And the time domain is no less daunting. You know, high speed biological signals in the brain can last a millisecond or less, but brain aging, memory formation, you know, the changes of brain states can take days, months, even years. So I sometimes only half jokingly say that our goal as a group is to figure out how to help biologists cross space and time. And these are not unique problems to the brain. If you study the immune system or aging or the spread of a cancer, we also deal with vastly differing spatial and temporal scales. So today I'll tell you two, uh, three short stories, one about space and two about time, uh, with the hope of uh, uh, explaining some of the technologies we've built that we hope can help people cross these different scales. Let's start with expansion microscopy, which is a way to help um, do nanoscale imaging of extended 3D objects. So of course, many pioneering um, microscope designers and physicists and chemists have developed fantastic nano imaging methods, uh, super resolution microscopes, for example, um, other forms of, of physical interfacing, such as electron microscopes, uh, cryo EM and so forth. But all these methods struggle to image large 3D objects uh, like a brain circuit. Uh, and they also uh, can require extensive equipment and or skills. So in our group, we often try to think about, you know, can we do the opposite of what people have been doing? And so we started thinking, what if we tried to physically magnify a biological specimen? So of course, this is not a living thing anymore, but suppose you could chemically synthesize a dense spider web-like mesh of swallowable polymer throughout a preserved biological specimen. Weave those uh, threads of swallowable polymer inside cells and outside cells, in between biomolecules and around biomolecules. If you anchor key biomolecules to the polymer, soften the specimen through chemical treatment, and add water, the swallowable polymer will, polymer will grow. But because of the little handles that we use to bind the biomolecules to the polymer, the biomolecules will be pulled apart. In other words, we could physically magnify a biological specimen, which we call expansion microscopy. So we first announced this discovery that we could evenly expand a biological specimen in 2015. Uh, led by two then graduate students in my group, Fei Chen and Paul Tilburg. Panel B is a small piece of the mouse brain before we expand it. Panel C, it's about 100 times bigger. We've created a dense spiderweb-like mesh of sodium polyacrylate, maybe better known as the active ingredient in baby diapers, and we have physically blown it up by about 100-fold in volume, four and a half-fold in each direction. The polymer threads start out very dense, just a few nanometers apart, comparable to the size of a biomolecule, and then uh, we can uh, uh, end up something like the cartoon in the lower left where the polymer threads are pulled apart from each other. First question I always get, is it precise? Well, it's pretty good. We get distortions of a few percent over a typical microscope's field of view. And it turns out for the vast majority of biological questions, that's what we want, the relative organization of biomolecules. Uh, we've done lots of pre versus post comparisons like shown on this slide to measure the amount of distortion that is incurred. Um, we can also measure the resolution. So when we expand by four and a half fold, um, a 300 nanometer resolution lens, a typical microscope lens, we now have a resolution of 300 divided by four and a half, or about 65 nanometers, and that's what we find. So here we have some cells in culture with fluorescent antibodies decorating microtubules. We can take what we see uh, and deconvolve by the known ground truth because microtubules have been studied for decades with classical techniques like electron microscopy, 
and we get a resolution of around 65 nanometers, which is what we expected. Now, you might remember that polymer spacing is really tiny, just a couple nanometers. If we expand more, can we get better resolution? And as I'll show you, the answer is yes. But even with four and a half fold expansion, there's a lot of things you can do that are difficult and sometimes even impossible to do with, with earlier techniques. So here on the left-hand side is the phi one YFP mouse cortex and hippocampus. Each white square is zoomed into the region below. The color code is shown on the left, again, fluorescent antibodies against different proteins. This is taken on a conventional confocal microscopes. Uh, and on the right is the same specimen, same fields of view, but after we've expanded, you can see much more detail. And in fact, the purplish blobs on the left are cleanly resolvable on the right in terms of these blue and magenta uh, protein densities. Blue is the pre protein bassoon. Magenta is the post protein Homer 1A. And the distance between these protein centroids is the same distance that Catherine Dulac and Zhao Wei Zhuang measured many years ago with storm microscopy. But now we can make this measurement on a conventional confocal microscope. This is some work uh, that we did with Eric Betzig's group, expanding and then uh, taking advantage of the transparency of an expanded specimen by using light sheet microscopy to go at blazingly fast speeds. Uh, in the upper right, we can look at mitochondrial and lysosomal proteins. Um, at the bottom, um, you can see here we're looking at myelin. This is work triply spear spearheaded by Ray Gao, Sho Asano, and Gokul Apariyula, working across our two groups. Um, you can express artificial uh, proteins, such as uh, fluorescent proteins engineered from jellyfish and coral. Um, here we are doing Brainbow, where we express combinations of fluorescent proteins using viruses in the brain. So different neurons ex exhibit different physical color codes. Um, and as you can see at the top, you know, quickly, of course, we hit the resolution limit of the microscope. But if we expand and then image, we can cleanly resolve in the upper right-hand corner individual axons. This happens to be in the hilus of the mouse at the campus. So far, what I've shown you is protein visualization, but we can visualize nucleic acids as well. Oswaski joined the team and co-led a project along with Faye to expand um, proteins and RNAs away from each other. And then we can do post-expansion in situ hybridization against the RNA. Here you can see in the upper left, uh, beta actin in the lower left um, exist in the lower right, need one. Um, and we can do these in cell culture as shown in this slide. But we can also do post-expansion in situ hybridization against RNAs in intact brain circuitry. So here we are looking at um, a specimen of brain uh, where we've anchored and expanded proteins. You can see YFP here, for example, and also RNA. And then the magenta dots are individual RNAs. So we can image with nanoscale precision the location and identity of individual expressed RNAs throughout brain circuits. Um, we can do multiplex analysis of RNA. So many pioneering scientists have developed ways of using libraries of hybridization probes against RNAs to look at dozens, even hundreds in a single sample. In work that was quintuply spearheaded by Shahar Alon, Dan Goodwin, and Isanha, Sinha, Azwasi, and Fei Chen, uh, we brought in hybridization probes against RNAs and then would sequence uh, little barcodes on the other side of these uh, so-called padlock probes, so-called because of their shape. And um, the barcode is not shown here, but we can sequence it. And uh, we can, uh, you know, when you sequence the nucleic acid, you're just copying it. And as you copy it, you're adding fluorescent nucleotides. And so uh, we can do that in intact brain specimens. Here's just one example here um, where you can see dendrites filled with, YF, filled with YFP. And uh, we can look at individual messenger RNAs, taking a cue from Aaron Schumann's wonderful surveys of dendritic RNAs. Uh, we synthesized about a couple dozen probe sets. Um, against RNAs identified by her group and other groups. And we're able to pinpoint with nanoscale precision individual RNAs from a library of these several dozen uh, messenger RNAs. And we can derive interesting patterns shown in the lower right um, about how these RNAs are distributed throughout different parts of brain cells. As a bit of a side note, this doesn't involve expansion, not yet anyway, but uh, we uh, saw an opportunity to use this kind of in situ sequencing strategy to look at uh, the genome as well. And so in a collaboration with um, Jason Van Roster and Fei Chen's groups, led by Andrew Payne, Zach Chang, and Paul Reginato, working across the, the two groups, the three groups, excuse me, we showed that we could insert barcodes into the genome and then sequence them in situ as well. Um, back to expansion, um, we asked, could we expand more than fourfold? And when J.B. Chang was a postdoc in the group, we polymerized and expanded a piece of brain, as shown in the cartoon in the upper left, 
form a second polymer in the space opened up by the first expansion and expanded it again. So four-fold expansion times four-fold expansion should give you about 15, 16-fold expansion. Now, this original version, which we published in 2017, um, was a little bit clunky. And so since then, Zibelina Sarkar, Jinyun Kang, and Oswasi, with great help from Margaret Schroeder, and Christina Kitko and Wuch Emanari have been developing important versions of this as well. We developed a way of doing the double expansion process using all off-the-shelf chemicals. And we noted this has an interesting possible bonus. In the cartoon at the top, you can see the green and red antibodies binding to proteins on the outside of a complex. But can you get to the inside of a protein complex? After all, most proteins um, have the opportunity to participate in 3D architectures within cells. Well, if you pull proteins apart from each other, maybe, as shown in the cartoon in the lower right, now the blue and the yellow antibodies can get inside and access uh, epitopes that are otherwise hidden. Uh, we decided to see if we could look at synapses, which of course are very dense and compactly arranged agglomerations of proteins, to see if we could actually resolve and identify previously invisible proteins. Well, here in panels B, C, and D, you can see yellow pre-expansion staining and purple post-expansion staining of a calcium channel subunit, a presynaptic protein, and a postsynaptic protein. And yes, there's a lot of a lot more purple than there is yellow. Uh, so decrowding the proteins from each other helps get access to the inside of these complexes. Not all proteins are so crowded. F, G, and H show three proteins that have comparable yellow and purple. So we started wondering. If we can see proteins now by decrowding them and enabling them, them to be better stained, are there things now that we can reveal that are difficult or impossible to see using other techniques? And so working with Tom Blanke's group, we decided to look at these nanocolumns, you know, coordinated pre and post synaptic proteins to try to see if we can see organization of, let's say, that new calcium channel that we just pointed out and post synaptic proteins. And to make a long story short, we did see detailed coordination of pre and post synaptic proteins they were not uniformly distributed, but instead were coordinated across the synaptic cleft. And so this might help with the precision of neural transmission. Working with Liwei size group, we looked at amyloid plaques, also extremely densely packed things. These are in 5X FAD model mice. Yellow is pre-expansion of a antibody against A beta 42. And magenta is the same specimen, uh, same antibody after expansion. And I hope you can see the purple images have a lot more detail than the yellow. In fact, we even saw these amyloid dots, almost periodic structures at the bottom here. And this held for two different A beta 42 antibodies, and we did not see them in wild type mice. So we're very excited now that expansion microscopy not only allows us to democratize nanoimaging, now we can do nanoimaging on regular old microscopes, but it might also, by decrowding molecules from each other, enable interesting reactions like the sequencing methods that I mentioned earlier or allow for better staining and labeling of densely packed molecules in complexes. How precisely can we expand? Well, at some point, we're going to hit the limit of the resolution of the polymer itself. And it turns out the polymer, of course, has a lot of inhomogeneities. Um, these are classical free radical poly synthesized polymers. And so Ray Gao and Jay Yu in our group, um, we decided to investigate whether we could use these so-called diamond lattice polymers to get much more even expansion. These are known in the field of polymer chemistry to yield almost perfect defect-free lattices. They're made out of these tetrahedral monomers, such as shown in the cartoon at the right. Using viruses as sort of a natural scale bar, uh, we showed that this so-called tetragel, as shown in the upper left, could result in very nice, evenly expanded viral shapes. Um, the older free radical gel, as shown in the right-hand panel of C, you can still see the, the rough circularity of the virus, but the shape is not as well preserved. And so in panel G, we saw that the resolution indeed um, improved. The accuracy of the expansion improved from you know, 15 to 20 nanometers or so down to nine or 10 nanometers. So we're excited that this might be the first um, uh, ability to get down to single nanometer resolution imaging and on, a, on an ordinary microscope uh, for that matter. So, um, uh, with, so this is uh, some examples here on the right of shapes of different viruses that excuse me, of herpes simplex virus, I forgot to mention the virus, um, where we're evaluating ellipticity and sphericity and other measures of shape. And indeed, um, the shapes are better preserved with this tetrahedral hydrogel than with the original. Of course, you can apply this to human tissues. This is work done by Yang Xin Zhao and Octavia Butcher, working between our group and many pathology groups like Astrid Wines, Andy Beck, and others. On the left are normal, and on the right are cancer-containing, 
specimens um, from human patients. Um, and uh, basically, uh, we have a lot of off the shelf, easy to use protocols. So let me summarize by showing a slide that's really not meant to be read, but just meant to really convey that expansion across is spreading very quickly. Uh, over 240 experimental papers and preprints have come out. These aren't like commentary pieces. These are actual experiments people are doing. It's being applied to the human kidney, to the fruit fly brain, um, to uh, plant seeds, to uh, viruses that have infected cells, and the list goes on and on and on. So in summary, we found that we could physically magnify objects. It lets you do nanoimaging on regular microscopes, and you could use it to visualize a wide variety of biomolecules uh, with a wide variety of resolutions. And our website, expansionmicroscopy.org, has um, all sorts of tutorials. We used to have all sorts of workshops, which were attended by people from hundreds of groups. But with COVID, of course, we can't do that. And so uh, last summer, we posted a step-by-step -step tutorial with lots of photographs, everything from how to handle a cover slip to how to pick up a hydrogel um, uh, you know, with, a, with a paintbrush and everything in between. And many people have learned how to do expansion from this tutorial. So that concludes the first half of the talk. Um, and uh, yeah, if you want to give it a try, uh, it really enables anybody to do nano imaging. So keep us posted. In the last half of the talk, I want to switch gears and talk about live signaling control and imaging. I just want to have a few slides in optogenetics because it's a fairly mature technology. Um, so in optogenetics, opto for light and genetics, uh, because the reagents we use are genetically encoded, um, we take genes from the natural world and put them into brain cells. The gene products then make those brain cells controllable by light. And so this started when Carl Dysroff and I were both students at Stanford and we started brainstorming, what are all the ways we could control neurons? And we just started making a list of all the laws of physics. There's only so many kinds of energy you can deliver into the brain. And we decided light would be the best if you could get away with it because it's very precise. And of course, as fast as anything ever gets. Um, the next question was, do we make or find the light sensors and I became really fascinated by this class of molecule known as microbial opsins, seven transmembrane proteins that sit in microbial membranes. A crystal structure of one is shown in the lower left. They're found in, for example, organisms that live in salty water. The first to be found was a light-driven proton pump about a half century ago. And then around uh, the early 1980s, people found light-driven chloride pumps. And then around the turn of the millennium, people found light-driven ion channels. And to make a long story short, because much of this has been published um, some time ago, we found that members of all three of these classes of molecule can be found that are fast enough, strong enough, safe enough, and efficacious enough to mediate the optical control of neural activity. So light driven proton pumps could be found that were safe, fast, and effective in neurons, express the gene in a neuron with a virus, shine green or yellow light, and you can turn those neurons off. Work done by uh, Brian Chow and Xiu Han when they work with me. Light-driven chloride pumps can also be found that are safe, fast, and effective. Um, and you can shine yellow or even red light to turn off neurons, work done by Xue and also Amy Chuang. And then finally, light-driven ion channels can be found that are safe, fast, and effective. The first of these Carl and I put into neurons um, and found that blue light could then be used to activate the neurons. And later, Nathan Klepetke pushed this into the red and um, Orshamesh collaborating with um, Valentina Miliani's group and, and others work to try to push these to their physical limits. And so these tools are in very widespread use to activate and silence neural activity. Uh, by turning neurons off, you can figure out what they're needed for. And by turning neurons on, you can try to probe their sufficiency. And I think that's all I want to say about optogenetics, because it is so mature and widespread. And I want to tell you about some new things that we're doing, um, which really, I think, uh, you know, exemplify this idea that we kind of lucked out with optogenetics. Um, and we have not been so lucky for the opposite of optogenetics, which is, can we observe high-speed signals in brain cells? You know, uh, the natural world evolved optogenetic molecules that basically out of the box worked. But the opposite is not true. We had to evolve in the lab indicators of fluorescent signals. And we're not the first to do that. But we wanted to have a good way of doing it in mammalian cells. When Erika Jung and Kiro Pjakovic, your postdocs, worked with me, we wanted to have a way to take a gene make many mutants of it, some are better and some are worse for any given goal, and to screen the gene products on multiple dimensions, things like safety, speed, efficacy, the same kind of things that made optogenetics popular. We bring in a robotic arm and we can pull out the cells and therefore the mutants 
that are better for our goal. So we decided to first try to make a fluorescent voltage indicator. We started with Quasar 2 from Adam Cohen's group at Harvard. And in two rounds of directed evolution, made 10 million mutants, expressed them in cultured mammalian cells, and selected in a multidimensional way for better brightness, better localization of the membrane, and better photostability. I'll take a long story short, it's kind of a crowded slide, but in the upper left, we made a molecule that we call Archon, which is better localized to the membrane than the parent gene. It is good signal to noise, as shown in the upper right, and it's pretty photostable. Working with Shua Han's group at BU, we showed that we could take a, a soma localized version of this to kind of clean up background fluorescence. And under a simple one photon microscope, shine a red laser and collect the infrared light, you can monitor the voltage of neurons in awake behaving mice. Um, and even you could look at a population of neurons. Here are about a dozen neurons in the mouse hippocampus, head fixed but awake. And on the right, you can see about eight of those neurons were active during this little movie. And so this is very exciting. You know, can we use such a robotic strategy to improve all sorts of fluorescent indicators? Now, of course, we're not the first to make fluorescent indicators. This is a screenshot from Jin Zhang's database at UCSD, where she has listed hundreds of fluorescent indicators, many from her group, uh, that will light up when a cell experiences some change in calcium or cyclic AMP or protein kinase A. And of course, there are countless signals we'd love to look at. Wouldn't it be great to look at many signals at once? Cells take in inputs. They have such complex networks of biomolecules within, and then cells generate outputs. Couldn't we look at all of them at once and inter in their interaction? Well, the classical answer was make a couple indicators of different colors, and you could use them together in the same cell. But that means you need to make a new indicator if you don't have one already. Wouldn't it be great to use existing indicators? Well, Shannon Johnson and Cheng Yang Ling Gu in our group worked on an alternative idea. What if we could park different fluorescent indicators at different points in a cell? Let's say the points labeled one would uh, have signal one uh, being broadcast from those points and the points labeled two would broadcast signal two. While the cell is alive, each dot will broadcast that signal even if they're all the same color um, and you collect little movies of the signals fluctuating. When you're done, you can stain, perhaps using techniques like I described in the first half of the talk, you can stain those dots with different tags and figure out which signals were at each point. And here's a protein architecture that makes it happen. Um, you can take different fluorescent reporters and fuse them to different self-assembling peptides. Then they'll cluster at different points in space. And then if each reporter has a different epitope, then that epitope can be stained with an antibody, uh, maybe over many rounds, so that you can identify them later. And so here is a little cartoon. You know, in green would be the live cell image. In magenta would be the image of the cell um, after you've stained it, potentially over many rounds. Um, and it works. So in panel B is GCAMP, a very popular calcium indicator. Panel C, we fused it to a pair of self-assembling peptides. The pair seems to help it cluster better, and it forms clusters. We did lots of control experiments looking at signal quality, kinetics, endogenous physiology, cell health, synapse density, microglial reaction, you name it. And we didn't see any differences between the clustered indicators and the regular ones. So now you can take three different indicators here for calcium, cyclic AMP, and PKA made by other groups. We fuse them to different self-assembling peptides and epitopes. In the green images are what you would see in the living cell, and the false color images are what you get after you stain with antibodies against the epitopes. So we can measure many signals at once in a living cell. This happens to be a cultured neuron. Um, and we can see the relationship between these different signals. Uh, in this case, we're driving the cell with forsklin and looking at calcium, cyclic AMP, and PKA. And we can see relationships between these different signals, how they all relate to each other in time and amplitude. So we're very excited about this. Can we really parse out how all these different signals work out? Uh, right now, we're working to try to improve the technique. Um, we've been able to get four signals at once to work in a single living neuron. Here we added a protein kinase C indicator. Again, green is the live image and the false color images are when we stain. Here you can see four signals at once, or we can even look at five signals at once. Um, here we added an ERK kinase indicator um, and you can see five signals at once. Anyway, there's a long way to go until we can look at, at everything. Uh, that's a, a long-term goal, but already I think there are questions that can be answered with the spatial multiplexing technology that are difficult to answer with older 
techniques. So to summarize the last half of the, last half of the talk, um, yeah, with optogenetics, we got very lucky. The natural world had evolved molecules that, you know, out of the box we could use to control neural activity. Um, but for imaging neural and other signals, we've been trying to both evolve better indicators as well as to figure out how to use existing indicators in new ways. And with that, I think I'll end. Uh, just to note that this, of course, is a very large scale collaborative effort involving people all over the world. Um, at the top are people who helped with the projects in our group and our alumni. In the middle is an even longer list of collaborators who helped with the, um, the uh, experiments that I talked about today. Um, and with, uh, with that, I'd be happy to take questions.